Praise is due to Allah and may Allah's peace and blessings be on the last Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and on all those who follow the path of righteousness until the last day. The topic, the struggle of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is one which addresses his legacy. What is it that Prophet Muhammad وسلم, left behind. In the Muslim world today, the legacy of Prophet Muhammad وسلم, may be looked at as hairs. You will find some parts of the Muslim world where people claim to have a hair from the head or the beard of Prophet Muhammad in Kashmir, they even have a mosque, the biggest mosque in Kashmir, a shrine to one of the hairs from the head of Prophet Muhammad Wasallam. It's called the Hazrat Bal Mosque. Of course, the fact of the matter, whether it is actually a hair from his head or from his beard or not, there's another issue altogether. You will also find in different parts of the Muslim world the tooth which was knocked out of the Prophet ﷺ's mouth in the battle of Uhud. One of his teeth was knocked out. And in Pakistan, they claim to have the tooth. In Morocco, they claim to have the tooth. In, in Turkey, they claim to have the tooth. And a number of other countries, he only lost one tooth. But this is the legacy. And you will also find uh, his sandals in the Topkapi Museum in Istanbul. You will also find the cloak that he wore, his sword, and a ver variety of other artifacts which are attached to Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu And people go there, you know, and will rub the cases in which these artifacts are and rub it on themselves believing that the baraka of these artifacts will be transferred to themselves. So the legacy in the minds of many ignorant Muslims is the artifacts and bits and pieces that were left behind which people claim were from Prophet Muhammad Wasallam. However, none of these artifacts, not a single one of them, can be authentically attributed to Rasulullah Wasallam. None of them. Because we have a principle for verification of the authenticity of any Islamic principle law, artifact, etc. That principle is the principle known as Sanad. Meaning, if somebody says, I have the hair of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam today. We say, okay, where did you get that hair from? I got it from so and so. Okay, where did he get it from? From so and so. Then you have to be able to trace all the way back to that person who got the comb of the Prophet ﷺ and took the hair out, the Sahabi. What was his name? Who did he give it to? And who he gave it to? And that has to be an authentic chain of reliable narrators. If you don't have that, then you don't have anything. It's just a hair. So Islam was never concerned with this. You don't hear the leading scholars of Islam concerned with these artifacts which are now found in the Muslim world. Reality is that the legacy which Prophet Muhammad وسلم, left behind was the legacy of da'wah. Of conveying the message of Islam to the world. This was his legacy. And that legacy is embodied in the struggle 
that he went through. He left in his struggle a blueprint which we can see mirrored in our day-to-day -day lives today. What is happening currently in the Muslim world in relationship to the rest of the world, we can see parallels between it and what Prophet Muhammad went through. I would imagine that the vast majority of us here this afternoon have already read the life of Prophet Muhammad They know, you know what he went through. So I'm not going to spend a lot of time in this presentation going over those details. I will mention the highlights in the sense that the beginning of the struggle was at the time of the announcement when he called his people together and announced to them that he was the messenger of Allah. After asking them who he was relative to themselves and they said you are the truthful, reliable, honest, best amongst us, etc. After reiterating that, then he told them, now if I tell you that I am the messenger of Allah, what is your thought? You are the biggest liar, you are the total opposite of everything they just finished saying. Okay. This was the rejection. With his announcement, the consequence was rejection. Complete rejection from the main uh, relatives, leaders of the society of the time. Then the struggle shifted to modes of persuasion. They sought to persuade him to stop. Stop this message. They tried to put pressure on his uncle who raised him, Abu Talib. Talk to this young man. Get him to stop this call, this invitation of people to the worship of one God, making slaves equal to their masters. Stop this. That failed. Abu Talib knew who Muhammad Sallallahu was and there was no way he could get the Prophet Sallallahu to give up conveying that message. So then they shifted to worldly persuasion. Worldly persuasion meaning he must be after something. He must have a hidden agenda. He's shaking up our society, creating havoc. He must have a hidden agenda. And what are the usual hidden agendas? Usual hidden agendas is based on what? Wealth, money. He's after money. Okay, let's offer him. We'll make him the richest man in Mecca. Everybody will put some money together and make him the richest. That didn't work. Okay. What is the next hidden agenda? Women. Okay. Let's offer him the most beautiful of our women. As many as he desires. That didn't work. Couldn't sabotage the message. Then it must be what? Power. Power. Control. To be the king, the ruler. So let's offer him that, that position, that status. Still didn't work. What next? Next step is the boycott. Okay, let's starve them into submission. Starve him. Of course, his, his clan supported him, the Hashemite clan. They said, if you do it to him, we have to be with him. He's from us. So the whole clan came under economic boycott. 
to try to bring him to his knees to stop this message. But even that didn't work. Instead, it ended with a miracle which reinforced in the minds of those who wanted to think that he must have been or must be a prophet of God. The pact which they had made and had hung in the Kaaba was eaten up except for Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. That's all. Bismillah. Everything was eaten up. Even though the Kaaba was closed, he couldn't possibly know what took place. He informed them that this happened and they went and confirmed that it had taken place. These were the evidences. The next step, escalating, step by step. Next thing is what? What's left? We have to kill him. Assassination. This is the only thing that's going to stop this man. We just have to finish him off. So, no one clan is going to take the responsibility. So we all take the responsibility. We get young men from all of our clans and in one blow, they kill him. But Allah told him to make hijrah. He left. Thwarted their efforts. After he left, wasn't enough. They put a bounty on him and sent bounty hunters after him. And they almost caught him. Suraq ibn Malik had caught up to him. But by a miracle from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he was unable to get a hold of him. Then after going to Medina, allies of the Meccans also tried to assassinate him there from Jewish clans. But they failed. And then came the major stage, the last major stage, that of what? Open warfare. Badr, Uhud, Khandaq. They tried and failed. So what was left? Truce. A truce which they worked out to their advantage as far as they could see it. They thought it was to their advantage. However, that truce failed. During the period of the truce, more people came into Islam than had ever come before. In the 13 years in Mecca, only 300 plus people accepted Islam. After the truce, truce of Hudaybiyah, you had 300 people, whole clans, coming to Islam on one day, coming and giving allegiance to Prophet Muhammad in one day. So the truce did not benefit those who sought to utilize it in their favor. And the return, Umrah, Prophet Muhammad came to Mecca, the Sahaba made Umrah, and finally the conquest of Mecca. These were the stages of the struggle of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. In that struggle, as I mentioned, there are parallels that we can see today. In the case of the announcement, there was rejection and slander. Prophet Muhammad is declared to be a magician and a fortune teller and a variety of other things. Today, we have him declared a pedophile by the uh, fundamentalist Christian groups. They promote this argument that he was a pedophile. And you have others like the Danish cartoonists making cartoons of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi No, So the slander is continuous. It hasn't changed. You know, we get shocked. We get worked up and we jump up and down and we demonstrate and we end up killing ourselves over something which is unavoidable. Instead of 
developing strategies to deal with these things systematically, we are reactionaries. And we die in the process. How many people lost their lives in the demonstrations against the cartoons around the Muslim world? Shameful. But they are ongoing. And they're not going to stop. After Peter filed, they'll find something else. It is a continual process. It wasn't new to Prophet Muhammad ﷺ. It existed in the times of all of the earlier prophets. They all suffered. Slander. Then the dissuasion. The efforts to persuade him not to convey the message. This we can see paralleled in many Muslim countries where giving da'wah is not allowed. Places like Tunisia, if you go to the masjid, you know, regularly your name is put on a list. The Muslim country. But the idea of trying to convey Islam is out. And so on and so forth. Different countries around the Muslim world. They are attempting to stop the da'wah. And of course the worldly persuasion we can see in Muslim rulers accepting the offerings of the West for their protection, etc. You know, and they're busy trying to keep their seats, their thrones, their positions. They want to look after it. So we see that happening. The difference is, of course, in the time of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu he rejected it. But in our times, our leaders have embraced it. This is the difference. And in terms of the economic blockade, whenever the word Sharia comes up, you find the West keen on blockading, you know, surrounding this and crushing it. Sudan is a class classical example. When Sudan declared Sharia back in 1984, America put an economic blockade on Sudan, which lasts till today. The longest blockade in history, with the exception of Cuba. Longest blockade in history with the exception of Cuba. To try to bring them to their knees and get them to give up this Sharia thing. This idea of Sharia. Because they don't want it to spread. It's like a disease. They're afraid that if it spreads, it will affect what? Their own economic well-being. In terms of the uh, assassination attempts, we know assassinations are happening around the world. One of the earliest assassinations was that of King Faisal of Saudi Arabia. A ruler who stood up to the West and said, okay, I'm shutting the taps. You know, because of what you guys are doing in Israel, etc. To the Palestinians, I'm shutting the taps. We are ready to go back and live on the desert as we lived before. No problem. He was a man of principle. And the only way to overcome that was to eliminate him. So he was assassinated. And others. And when we look at the next stages, the stage of open warfare, what, is, what happened to Iraq but open warfare? Afghanistan, southern Sudan, this is open warfare to try to stop the spread of Islam. Of course, they may make issues, bin Laden, uh, weapons of mass destruction, they take up different points to glorify and to beautify what they're engaged in, but they're program is simply to undermine the Muslim ummah, 
keep it down, keep it under control, to keep regular and, and easy access to the wealth of the ummah. And of course, the truth is we know, after all that they have said about the Taliban, they're now in truth, uh, negotiation, negotiating truth with the Taliban. After saying they would never speak to the Taliban, these guys are this and that and the other, we will never come to the table with them, they're now at the table working things out. So, this cycle is inevitable. It is a cycle which all of the earlier prophets went through, most documented in the life of Prophet Muhammad Wasallam, because he was the last of the messengers. We don't have the details in the struggles of the earlier prophets like what we have in the case of Prophet Muhammad Wasallam, because he was to be the last of the prophets of God. So we have that blueprint. On one hand, to keep us aware of what we are living, why we are living this. And the issue is, most of the Muslim world is unaware of what is going on. These are all separate events happening to them here, there, and everywhere. But when we look at the life of the Prophet Muhammad we can see this is a chain of events, all linked, following a, a familiar pattern. That if Muslims are not conscious of it, then they are unable to benefit from that knowledge. They learn the history of the Prophet ﷺ like they learn fairy tales. You know, everybody knows the details of this, that, and the other. But what it all means, virtually nothing in our lives. There's no way of benefiting from it practically in our in day-to-day -day lives. However, Alhamdulillah, the return and the conquest, the reconquest of our Muslim lands is coming. The sahwa or the awakening in the Muslim world today is real, it's happening. Libya, Tunisia, Egypt, Syria, Yemen, the other countries that are going through changes, this is all a part and parcel of that return. But we shouldn't be fooled at the same time with orchestrated changes because the West is very uh, skilled in manipulating movements, struggles, etc. So what may look to be truly Islam coming to the forefront we can find signs that it's not truly Islam. There is some Islam there, but it's what will be tolerated. You know? So the struggle isn't over. We still have a long way to go. However, in this struggle of Prophet Muhammad wasallam, is another message for us, another sign, an awakening point for many of us who have lost contact with the Qur'an. It contains proof of the prophethood of Prophet Muhammad As he said, all prophets were given something which would cause people to believe in them. The thing which I was given is none other then the revelation, the Qur'an, which Allah revealed to me. So I hope that I will have the most followers among them on the day of judgment. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave the prophets miracles to convince their people that they were in fact prophets of God. Because if somebody stands up and says, I'm a prophet of God, we say, what's your proof? How do we know you're a prophet of God? We have so many false prophets around. So the miracles were given to them to prove to the people, those who were willing to open their hearts, 
that they were in fact prophets of God. And what Allah did is that He chose miracles which were in the areas that the people excelled. So that the miracles would have a greater impact on them. So for example, Prophet Moses, السلام, who was raised up in Egypt. Egypt was known for sorcery, magic. So he was given a miracle which was like what the magicians were doing, but it was greater. His staff, when he threw it on the ground, became a snake. Now the magicians of Egypt could do that too. But the thing is that they were doing a trick on the people. They were mesmerizing the people. People thought, thought they saw this, these uh, sticks as snakes, but they really weren't. They just appeared to be moving. They threw them on the ground and it appeared that way to them. Whereas in the case when Musa, السلام, when he threw the stick, it really became a snake. And it ate up the false snakes of the other magicians. Which is why they submitted. They prostrated to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala immediately. They knew the truth when they saw it. In the case of Prophet Jesus, alayhi salam, who was sent amongst the Jews, the Jews were known, and even till today, they were known for medicine. The top medical experts around the world, if you look and see who they are, they're Jews. Being the top medical experts puts you in a critical position. If you are a president who is working against them, operations can easily fail. Accidents happen. <laughs> it's a very, very crucial position to be in. So they make sure the top heart surgeons, the top you know, medical experts are from amongst themselves. Crucial. So, in those days, of course, the medical uh, doctors were able to heal people who broke their arms, you know, who had eye diseases, you know, etc. They were able to do what appeared to the people who had no knowledge of the medicines and the techniques as something almost miraculous. So, Prophet Isa was given a miracle in the same area, except on another level. Instead of just fixing a broken bone, somebody who was born crippled with a birth defect, he fixed. Something which the Jewish doctors could not. People who are born blind, he made them see. Jewish doctors couldn't do that. So he was on a whole nother level. He even brought the dead back to life. That's something definitely was not in their hands. People got sick, they got them well, but not somebody is dead, he's declared dead, he's coming back to life again. So, Prophet Muhammad وسلم, being the last messengers of Allah, he was also given miracles to prove to the people that he was a prophet of God. However, his miracle had to be on yet another level. He had miracles which were on the similar level of the other prophets. When the Quraysh asked him to show them, show them a sign, he pointed to the moon and the moon split in front of them. That was a miracle. But that type of miracle was not the main miracle of the Prophet ﷺ. Why? Because he was to be the last of the message. If somebody asked you, prove to me that Prophet Moses' staff, his staff turned into a snake. Do we have the staff of Prophet Moses in a museum somewhere? Turning into a snake and back into a staff? Do we have this anywhere? You heard about that? No? No. Nowhere. 
Or somebody said, okay, prove to me that he split the Red Sea. Do we have a marker somewhere in the Red Sea where you can see a split till today? No. Okay, somebody says, okay, prove to me that Prophet Jesus made the dead come back to life. Do we have the dead man who he called back to life around? So we can say he died and here he is. Or the blind who saw. Or the birds that he made from clay blew on it and it flew away. Do we have any of those things? No. These are things that we believe in. Similarly, we believe in the moon. Yes, there is somebody who said, yeah, you know when the first uh, moon lander landed on the moon for the Americans and they were walking around, they did find the crack in the middle of the moon. It's not true. It's Muslim fairy tales, right? We're looking for, you know. Or the story about um, uh, one of the uh, astronauts hearing the adhan on the moon. Not a fairy tale. Then he went to Egypt and he heard the same adhan again. He became a Muslim. Not true. What was his name again? Uh, Neil, huh? Neil Armstrong, yes. Because they call Neil Armstrong, he's still a Christian. He doesn't, he'd never heard any other, and it's not true. Widespread, you know, like all these fishes that we find with scales saying Allah, and, you know, we're famous for this stuff, right? But <laughs> may Allah protect us. Anyway, the point is that these miracles are not tangible we can't hold them now they happened at the time and they served that purpose but prophet muhammad sallam was to be the prophet till the end of the world he was the prophet to all humankind till the end of the world so he had to have a miracle which would last which people could say today show me the miracle he said, here it is you had to have that that was unique so that miracle, his main miracle, as he said, it was the Qur'an. Because what were the Arabs known for? Were they known for medicine? No. Were they known for magic? No. Technology? No. They were not known for any of these things. The only thing they were known for was poetry, prose, eloquence. They loved their literature. And they had taken it up to such a height they used to have yearly competitions where people would come from all over Arabia, you know, like rap artists, right? Rap artists, this one raps and that one raps. It's like this, they were saying huge long poems. People would memorize these poems hearing at one time. They're heavy into this. The eloquence, they loved the word, the literary word. So Allah gave them the miracle right where they love the most. And he took the letters that they used to make up their lovely poetry and prose and he stuck it at the beginning of 14 of the chapters of the Quran. Alif Lam Mim. Watch this. Something that the Arabs never did. This was something outside of the normal. They never did this before. But it was the challenge to them. See this same Alif La Mim that you make all those poems that you love so much, so much that ten of them you've written on gold uh, bars and hung it on the Kaaba. You worship it. The Mu'allaqat. They worship them. They worship their poetry. So Allah gave them Qaf and blew their minds. Wow. Something which they could not imagine. Literary eloquence at a level which was beyond their comprehension. It mesmerized them. That's why they said he's a magician. When you go by his house, put your finger in your ears. Otherwise, it will just catch you and you're... Shadu Allah, ilaha illallah. Better put your finger in your ears. The point is that this literary miracle was so real that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala challenged the Arabs. Three levels of challenge. First level, if you don't believe this is from Allah, produce a Quran like it. They couldn't do it. Okay, 
If you don't believe this is from Allah, produce 10 chapters like it. Okay, still couldn't do it. Okay, you don't believe this is from Allah, produce one chapter like it. And he repeated this verse in Mecca and Medina. Produce one chapter like it. Smallest chapter, Al Kawthar, is only three lines. They still couldn't do it. And they tried, but they couldn't do it. Now, some people might say, well, what's so magical or so miraculous about these three lines of poetry? Why? Because we look at it, most of us look at it from our various languages. When we read the Quran, we read the Quran in our languages, translated, translated meanings. So we read and we see, you know, I, I read this, this uh, chapter of the Quran and I know other English writers who have written much better, you know, literary works than this. This is just mediocre stuff. I don't see anything magical about it. Why? Because the miracle of the Quran is not in English or Urdu or Bengali or Somali. It is in Arabic. It's in Arabic. But even the Arabs today might not be able to grasp it. The common Arabs today because they have lost touch with the language of the time when it was at its peak. So, if for example, a missionary, and some brothers came to me and asked me about this, a missionary says to you, if I produce a chapter like the Quran, will you convert to Christianity? Most Muslims say, oh, I, I don't know, I don't, I don't think I can do that. We hesitate. We should say, yes, I'm ready to convert to Christianity if you produce one chapter like it. Allah says you cannot, you produce one, I'm ready. Right now. But most of us wouldn't do that. They, we, if that's put in front of us, we say, oh, <laughs> I'll have to think about that one. Why? Because we doubt. We doubt the miraculous literary nature of the Quran. We doubt it. And as I said, the average Arab, he or she may not be able to grasp that miraculous nature. So if the missionaries put together something, and they did, they put together a religious book called Al-Furqan. Yeah, called Al-Furqan. And... Just as we begin with Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim, they have it beginning with Bis Bismi Bismi Isa al Masih al Tathlis. And the story of Genesis is put into Arabic rhyme and poetry. And if you were to read this to the average Arab who didn't know, maybe Bismi, Bismi Isa al Masih, you know. Ilahu Tathlith. Ah, okay, they might catch that one. But if you, the rest of it where God is replaced with Allah, just as in Arabs, in their Arab translation of the Bible, they use Allah. They may hear some of these and say, yeah, that's Quran. And they may swear, yes, wallahi, this is Quran. Because they're out of touch with that language. So the missionary will say, well then, we are able to do it. But how do we judge whether somebody has successfully imitated the Quran or not? Do we give it to the average person and ask him, what do you think? Somebody who has some background in English literature could write a sonnet in the style of Shakespeare and show it to the average person who has read a few Shakespeare things and they say, yeah, yeah, that's Shakespeare. Sounds just like him, Shakespeare. 
But if you gave it to a Shakespeare expert, they would say right away, no, that's not Shakespeare. They could spot the mistakes. So it means that the only way that you could judge this would be to give it to an Arabic literature expert who is of necessity in most cases an Arab and in most cases Arab Arabic literary experts are Muslims they say ah, it's biased so how, how can we depend if your people are going to be judging whether we did it or not you're just not gonna accept it anyway it's biased what else to do if we are the experts who else can judge the point is that the expert will tell you this is not of that standard. Why? Because here are the weaknesses in it. Here, here, there, there. It's weak from this point. They will identify it. So they'll do it academically. They're not just going to say, no, it's not because we don't feel like it is. No, no. They will give you the points. Why not? The non-Arab Arabs Arabic experts, they will tell you, for example, in the Quran there are mistakes, grammatical mistakes. Now, uh, Baha'u'llah, the founder of the Baha'is, he had a book called Al Kitab al Aqdas, the holiest of books. Right? This was his book of revelation in Arabic. However, when knowledgeable Arabs looked at his writings, they said, hey, he's filled with grammatical mistakes. Because he wasn't an Arab. He was a Persian. <laughs> right? You know? So he wrote, he made mistakes. So they said, no, this is a new divine grammar. Right? When the non-Muslim... Arabists say there are mistakes in the Quran. They say, Tilka Rusul. Rusul. What is this? Everybody knows you pick up any book of Arabic grammar, it tells you that if you have a demonstrative pronoun, there are different forms which must match the noun that it is governing in gender and number. So, you only use tilka when you're referring to feminine nouns. You will not say tilka al-kitab, you'll say dhalika al-kitab. And, when you're dealing with plural, you have ha'ulai and ulaika. So what you're supposed to have here is Ula'ika Rusul Not Tilka Rusul Okay, this is maybe above some of your heads But the point is that Arabic grammar came from the Quran So you can't go back to the Quran and say the Quran made mistakes You know Those people who are experts in grammar will tell you yes you can use tilka. It is used, it was used in ancient Arabic poetry, it was used in the Quran. It is a, a use for special emphasis, but it not became it was no longer in common use. After time passed, people focused on one element of the grammar and they left the other elements for classical literature. That's all. There's no grammatical mistake in the Quran. Not like Baha'u'llah. Baha'u'llah was telling something else. So, when Baha'u'llah said in his Kitab al-Aqdas, if you don't believe that this is from Allah, produce one word like it. Hey, come on. It's a joke. It's a joke. Nobody had to produce one word like it because we all know, you know, words are, you can pick the dictionary up and produce how many words like it. It's just a joke. Or like when Elijah Muhammad in America, we had a false prophet there by the name of Elijah Muhammad, who taught that white people were devils and black people were Allah's. 
this was his teachings, right? Nonsense, of course. He said, I challenge any white person to come up and prove that he isn't a devil. And of course, no white person went up into Chicago, you know, challenged him and said, okay, here I'm, prove you I'm not a devil. So he said, see, none of them have come. They are devils. So the challenge of the Quran is not like that. The challenge of the Quran is not like that. We just looked at that struggle of the Prophet ﷺ. His struggle. What he went through. What the Quraysh did to try to stop him. All of that. What they offered him. The, their loss of their lives and their wealth. All of this to try to stop him. And all they needed to do was to produce three lines of poetry like Kawthar. Surah Al-Kawthar. That's all they had to do. Do you think, practically, logically, that they would, if they were able to do it, they would do this, go through all that struggle, instead of doing this so much simpler thing? No. So in the struggle of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa is the sign that the Qur'an is a miracle. A literary miracle. That though we cannot grasp it due to our weakness of our language, etc. We can't grasp it on that level where we can read it and say, wow, we can understand it in the struggle of Rasulullah A struggle which overcame all odds. A struggle which would not have taken place if there was a way out. The call of Rasulullah to Tawheed, that shook the whole of Meccan society. The socio-economic order was being challenged. The religious center of Arabia was being demolished. They had every reason to meet that challenge. So, in that struggle, Inshallah, we can see, we can learn, we can appreciate the Qur'an, which is the true legacy which Prophet Muhammad has left for us, tangible in our hands, and the message of the Qur'an is to worship Allah alone, and that is the total legacy that we have to carry to the people of British Columbia, to the people of Canada, to the people of the world. This was the legacy from the struggle of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Barakallahu Fikum, Jazakumullah Khair for listening and I hope that whatever I said was of benefit and whatever errors are there are from me. Barakallahu Fikum, Assalamu Alaikum Warahmatullahi Wabarakatuh.